Welcome back, everyone, to Reactception. That's what this is going to be. Um, so I was talking to my friend, Mr. Terry, yesterday. Uh, I think based on my understanding of YouTube, he and I are the two uh, biggest in terms of subscriber base uh, history reaction channels on YouTube. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. Uh, anyway, I was talking to him yesterday because he sent me a message uh, mentioning that he was going to do a reaction to my recent original content about my favorite facts about the U.S. presidents. So I thought in light of that, it might be fun to do a reaction to his recent original content that came out a couple of weeks ago uh, on five greatest mysteries from history. Uh, so we're going to take a look at this. It'll be fun. I don't know if his reaction to my video is coming out today or not, but it would be extra cool if it is. Uh, so uh, the link is in the description if you want to check out his video or if you're not familiar with his channel. And I don't know how you wouldn't be because he's the OG of History React content. Uh, he's been around a lot longer than I have and was one of the inspirations for me doing reactions myself. Uh, but if you haven't seen it already, go ahead and check it out. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. One of the greatest things about history is that we are always learning and everything is always up for interpretation as new yep. evidence is discovered. So then, what are some of the greatest mysteries of history that we haven't solved yet? Here are five for you to figure out. Easter Island, or Rapa Nui in its indigenous language, is one of the most isolated places on the planet. More than a thousand years ago, the inhabitants of the island erected hundreds of stone structures known as moai. Carved primarily from stone from the volcanic ash with hand tools, the statues were transported long distances to positions on stone platforms. However, we don't know what their purpose was. So he, he makes a great point at the beginning there that I just want to stop and kind of touch on a little bit, and that is that uh, even with structures and art and history from thousands of years ago, we are still learning about those things. Classic example of this is when the Rosetta Stone was discovered uh, just barely more than 200 years ago. Think about the fact that 200 years ago, we were just starting to learn to interpret Egyptian hieroglyphics and what a world that opened up to us as far as understanding history. So 200 years ago, even though in the grand scheme of how long ago the Egyptian uh, empire existed, the kingdom, I guess you would say, not empire, we use those words interchangeably, uh, we didn't know nearly what we know today because of discoveries. Every day there are discoveries in places like Israel where we are re learning what we know about events that happened three, 4,000 years ago. South America, Asia, all of that is the same. We've got this massive tomb of China's first emperor that has yet to be explored, really. We know where it is. We know it's there. And we have, a, we have written descriptions of what's in there, but we haven't really gone in and explored it yet. Imagine what that's going to do to our understanding of Chinese history. Uh, so it's not that history changes, per se, it's just that what we know about it is always being updated. How exactly were they moved? Easter Island mythology says that the statues walked. And recently, archaeologists have shown that the Easter Islanders might be right. A few dozen people using ropes oh. could rock a moai from side to side on its base and walk it forward. By the time European explorers huh. arrived, many of the moai were toppled over. Maybe they were symbols of power between warring groups. Or so when he pointed out the thing about how they were described as walking, it would be easy for us to hear that description and dismiss it and say, well, they were statues. Of course, they didn't walk. But I love that he showed that clip there because it shows how their understanding of what that means means there was some truth to it. Not in the way that we understand walking, but that they were walked. And and one of the things I've found in, in family history research, you know, families always have those stories of, oh, great, great grandpa was a bootlegger or um, they uh, I had an uncle who was in one of Lincoln's bodyguards. Those are examples I use because those are two specific examples in my own family where initially I brushed them off as being hogwash and then found out there was truth to those statements. Uh, so when those stories get passed down, there's typically some reason why they got passed down, and there's probably some truth to it somewhere. Maybe we just need to think outside the box, like the idea of walking. 
or maybe they had a peaceful religious purpose. Wooden and stone tablets found at the location are also a mystery. They contain an undeciphered form of writing. Like the statues, the script has so far defied explanation. The Karnak stones. Mm. More than 3,000 upright stones were aligned with with the French village of Karnak. The single stones, called menhirs, and the multi-stone groups, called dolmens, stretch for some two miles. Hmm. It's believed that the stones have stood for thousands of years, while archaeologists have not traced their purpose or origins as of yet. I'm really surprised that those stones didn't get hauled away by someone to be used in building at some point. I'm guessing there must not be any large settlements real close to there where that would have happened. These megaliths have been recognized as sacred by Breton culture. Ancient Romans carved their gods on the granite surfaces, while later on, Christians added their own symbols to them. According to one legend, the menhirs are the rocky remains of an army of pagans who chased St. Cornelie toward the sea. When Hmm. cornered, he turned the army into stone. However, the stones are far older than Christianity, most likely date back to Brittany's pre-Celtic Neolithic period, which ranges from between 4500 BC to 2000 BC. Were they erected as tribute to their gods? Did they honor ancestors with them? Were they used to track alignments of the sun or stars? So far, the secret's still out there. So that time period, 4500 BC to 2000 BC, or whatever it was he said there, um, that's really kind of the beginning of what we have as far as any kind of real written history goes. We don't have really much written history for that time period, but that's where we can date things like the pyramids and a lot of the early stuff that was built in Egypt. It's where a lot of the early Mesopotamian stuff is created. It's really the very beginnings of civilization. The Great Ohio! Serpent Mound. The Great Serpent Mound is more than 1,300 feet long, about 20 feet wide, and 4 to 5 feet high. It- you know, I've never been there. My my great-grandparents uh, on both sides of my family, my father and mother's side, came from uh, Kentucky and then were in Portsmouth and Chillicothe, Ohio, before they came to Northeast Ohio. And so that wasn't really that far from there. I think that's in Adams County, which is in Southern Ohio. Uh, it's kind of between Portsmouth and Cincinnati, but I've never been to Serpent Mount. It takes its shape across the hills of Southern Ohio, the largest effigy mound in the world. Yep. The tail ends at a coil, and its head appears to be swallowing a giant egg. The real mystery, though, is who built it and what does it mean? It was first described in the Adenas, 1840s probably. and was originally attributed to the ancient Adena people. Who inha- yeah, so when, when you grow up in Ohio, I don't know if this is still the case, but it certainly was for me. Uh, in middle school, you do uh, a year of Ohio history, uh, and we spend a lot of time learning about the the uh, the early mound building tribes that lived in Ohio. One of which uh, was the Hopewell, and one was the Adena. Those are kind of the two that we learn a lot about. Inhabited the area from about 500 BC to 100 AD, and whose remains are found in nearby burials. However. Radiocarbon dating has suggested that it is younger, probably about 900 years old. Hmm. The Fort ancient culture was influenced by the Mississippi culture, which featured rattlesnakes in much of their work. Some archaeologists have pointed out that the serpent mound's head aligns with the summer solstice. So perhaps it has an astronomical or ceremonial purpose. Since no artifacts or written records are found with it, the mystery remains. The not- it's a really fascinating thing, and there are these mounds everywhere, and it's not just in Ohio. They're in... Uh, huge parts of eastern United States. You go down to the Shiloh Battlefield in Mississippi uh, and Sh- Mississippi, Tennessee. Shiloh is in Tennessee. Uh, it's close to Mississippi. Uh, and there are mounds there. There are uh, Indian mounds on the battlefield. Nazca lines. Oh, these are Around 2,000 years ago, ancient people in modern-day Peru etched more than a 1,000 figures into the coastal desert. Quadrangles, trapezoids, spirals, narrow lines, and outlines suggests that the shapes of giant creatures span across hundreds of square miles located between the towns of Nazca and Papa. And this is a great example of how we should never underestimate what ancient peoples were capable of. I'm continually blown away by uh, much of what the Egyptians did, especially what the Romans were able to do, especially having just come back from Italy, uh, but also in South America and Central America and North America. Uh, their understanding of engineering and geometry was well advanced compared to what I think we give them credit for. In the 1920s, trans andean pilots rediscovered the enormous geoglyphs during their flights. Over the past century, many explanations have come and gone. We know that the people that built them it was thrived aliens. from about 200 BC to 600 AD. 
Researchers have theorized that they could represent irrigation lines, an astronomical calendar, Inca roads, images viewed from above by the gods. And interestingly, space... See, that seems to make the most sense to me is that they were making these to be seen by the gods. I mean, it seems consistent to me. I don't understand a lot about South American culture, but just on the surface, that seems like the obvious choice. ...ports for alien aircraft. However, today's leading explanation tends to be much simpler. The glyphs may have formed ceremonial pathways. Many of the figures are associated with rain or fertility, mm -hmm. and traces of footprints can still be seen along wow. the lines. El Dorado. Ah. The first El Dorado was, in fact, a man, not a city. Really? Spanish conquistadors in South America heard the legend early in the 1500s. Somewhere in the Andes Mountains, they were told by the indigenous Muisca people that they would initiate a new chief by dusting him with gold from head to toe and to toss gold and emeralds into a sacred lake. So when I first heard about the idea of El Dorado, it made me wonder, because obviously the conquistadors, one of their big... Uh, motivations was finding gold and riches that they could take back and uh, or make themselves wealthy and I thought well maybe they're just being led to some remote place by these natives to get them off their back and say oh yeah there's a there's a city of gold up in those hills over there but I'm sure there's probably more to it than that filled with greed Spanish English Portuguese and German plunderers pursued deep into the wilderness of Colombia Guiana and Brazil and anywhere else they found enticing in search of this legendary treasure. Among the interested treasurer seekers was Sir Walter Raleigh, whose son Watt died in the attempt in 1617. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I know Sir Walter Raleigh is buried in, there's a little chapel if you go to Westminster Abbey in London. Uh, right next to Westminster Abbey, there's a smaller chapel, and he's actually buried in there. Was himself executed was. upon his return to Europe for disobeying the king's instructions. Many people, both Native Americans and Europeans, died in these greedy quests. However, the golden treasure was never found. There may be some truth to the legend, though. The lake mentioned in the Muisca story may be Laguna Guatavita, located high in the Andes near Bogota, Colombia. Some golden objects and jewels have been recovered from the lake, but attempts to drain the lake and recover the further riches have all failed. Mm. If there is a treasure down there, it still remains to be found. Uh-oh, I, I sense another History Channel series on uh, looking for lost treasure in South America. So, will you be pursuing these mysteries? What are some other mysteries from history? Let me know in the comments below. All right, that was good, Mr. Terry. Good job on that. I enjoyed that. Uh, I actually learned some things about some subjects I don't know a lot about. So, what do you guys think about that? Let me know in the comment section below. Uh, and if you want to see uh, more of me reacting to things that other reactors do, let me know what you'd like to see, and I'll try to do that. Thanks for watching.